Okay, thank you, thank everybody for coming, so to speak. Um, so you can see the title of my talk. Uh, it is joint work with uh, Matia Katz and a bit of it also with uh, Pankaj Lagarwal, and it has to do with geometric optimization. Uh, I will talk about a technique that was kind of buried in an, in an old, relatively old paper that we wrote about uh, seven years ago uh, on some variant of the Frechet distance problem. Um, and it turned out that it is quite <clears throat> powerful to solve many other problems. And so I will describe the technique and, and discuss extension, how it can be extended and, and so on. And in particular, to extend it into more interesting or more general problems, you need to combine it with uh, semi-algebraic range searching, which is also a fairly recent uh, 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 research topic that has emerged only in the last few years. So I will talk about it a little bit uh, uh, too. And kind of uh, go over the various optimization problems that this method uh, um, solves more efficiently or than other methods. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, using random sampling that in a way that sometimes can significantly improve the performance of optimization algorithms. Um, so the paper, the paper where this technique was born by Ben Abraham, Filzer, Kaplan, Katz, and myself, the, the title is something like the discrete Frechet problem with one-sided shortcuts. So as usual with the Frechet distance, uh, we have a, a discrete version thereof. We have two frogs, and each one has to jump through a sequence of stones in, in a forward manner. Uh, but this shortcut business allows one frog, just one of the frogs, to skip stones in the sequence. And the goal in the Frechet game is to schedule the trips so that the maximum distance between the frogs is, is as small as possible. So it's an interesting variant of the Frechet distance, perhaps not the most uh, outstanding one, uh, although I liked it when we did it, but the technique somehow is, as I perceive it now, much more interesting than the, the particular application there. Um, let me just say that, that in that paper, we solved this Frechet, discrete Frechet distance with shortcuts in n to the six, uh, uh, five, six over five uh, uh, time. And we will see this exponent uh, and other exponents recurring uh, in the talk. Um, so uh, the running example on which I want to exemplify this technique, which is a, a new application, <clears throat> is the reverse shortest pass problem in unit disk graph. So what does it mean? Um, we have a set of endpoints in the plane. And Suppose we are given some real parameter distance r, and we draw a disk of radius r over two, say around each point of p, and then we form the intersection graph of uh, of the disks. So a, a, the vertex set of the graph is p itself, and the edges are all the pairs p q such that the disk around p and the disk around q intersect. Uh, but this is equivalent to say that it's a, it's a set of all pairs of points that lie a distance that most are apart by the triangle inequality. And this is called the unit disk graph on P. Now unit means that the disks have unit radius. Here the unit is R over two, but that's just a technical nuance. Um, so this is an intersection graph, but the, the analysis applies equally well to proximity graphs where you have objects, geometric objects in the plane or in higher dimensions. And then you, again, you have some threshold distance R and you 
take all pairs of objects that lie a distance at most r from each other. Um, and an intersection graph, um, sorry, a proximity graph can be regarded as this intersection graph by the simple trick of expanding each object by a disk of radius r over two. So you form the Minkowski sum of each object with such a disk. For example, here we have three segments um, and the distances between them as shown here are say smaller than R. And, and we see it by drawing a, a, the Minkowski sum of each uh, segment, the, the so-called race track or arena or whatever, uh, um, by expanding it by R over two. And those segments at distance at most R become race tracks that intersect each other. And so and it's equivalent. So we can think of both types of graphs essentially more or less equivalent versions of one graph. Uh, so what is the reverse shortest path problem? Uh, so we have the set P and two designated points S and T in P. And we have some integer K. And we want to find the smallest radius R star or distance for which the intersection graph G R star has a path from S to T of length at most K. So here you can see such an example. The, the radius of these two disks is, the, is this R star over two. And for such a value, you, you indeed have a path from S to T of length four. And for smaller values of R, you do not. Um, another way to, to interpret exactly the same definition is to say that you want to find a path from S to T of length at most K, so that the longest edge in the path is as short as possible. So this, is the, this will be the, the R star that we are talking about. So there are all kinds of applications why this problem is interesting. For example, in communication uh, networks, you, you, uh, I give you the number of hops between S and T, and I want to find the minimum power, the, the radius of coverage of each uh, 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 node in the network that will guarantee the existence of such a, such a path. So this problem has been, we did not invent it, it has been studied around. And, uh, and recently, Wang and Zhao uh, uh, solve it by a, a complicated algorithm that runs in O star n over uh, n to the five over four uh, time. The star notation is just to hide uh, 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 factors like n to the epsilon or polylogarithmic and so on. So it's uh, 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 so I'll just use use it freely during the talk and. Using this technique that I will soon talk about, we managed to improve it to n to the six five, six fifth. Um, uh, so, Micha, what is the star? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Maybe. Uh, it's the notation to to hide polylog a tiny polylog or factors of the form n to the epsilon. So you might say that the running time is n to the six five plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero and things like that, okay? And there is no depend, dep dependency on k or it's in the big O? Uh, no, not, uh, I mean, maybe there is, but you you don't uh, you don't highlight, as if, just in terms of n, of the input size. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, the optimization problem is to, to find the uh, smallest R star uh, and so on, but it, has, it usually comes with a decision procedure where I give you R and ask you, does GR contain an ST pass of length at most K? Um, now, this is not completely trivial. In fact, it's quite tricky to do it because in, in general, GR can have a quadratic number of edges, and you don't want to explicitly construct it. Um, now, to test whether it has a path of length at most k, you want to run BFS on the graph. But again, if you run BFS naively, you will pay. You might 
a, a, a quadratic time which you want to evolve. So you, you do it more cleverly or more carefully and by a grid-based uh, uh, approach. Um, I'll show you this thing again. By, uh, this has been done by Chen and Skrepetos some time ago. And it can, uh, they implemented it to run in linear time. The general idea, I will not go into the details of this, but just a, a little bit of a few hints. Uh, if you place the points in a grid of size R over square root two, every pair of points in the same cell of the grid are a distance at most R from one another, so they form a click in the graph. So once you, you are in a, in a cell, you, once the BFS has reached a cell of the grid, it kind of, all the points there uh, uh, go into the next layer in the worst case. Uh, but, but also any other neighbor of any point in the grid has to lie in a nearby cell, maybe not exactly the next cell, but two cells apart or something like that. So, <clears throat> so the trick is that once you have a point in a cell and you want to perform a step of the BFS, you look at the nearby cells and you ask each point and each point of in the, these cells ask whether it has a neighbor in the cell from which you are starting the search a, a distance at most hour and to to do it there is a nice trick that you take all the points of interest in the cell and you draw the disks around them uh, and you let the disk cross a boundary, vertical or horizontal boundary of the, of the cell, and the, the other points lie on the other side of the boundary, and they see the disks as only as small pieces, and they have to determine whether they lie, to, in this case, to the left or to the right of the upper end of the disks. If they lie to the left, then the, they have a neighbor, in the, uh, in the current layer and they can go to the next layer and if not, then they can. So if you work out all the details, every point is examined only a constant number of time and you compute the envelopes in, in a clever manner too, you don't even pay a log, you get a linear time algorithm, which is nice. But the problem is, and we will soon go into parametric search and all the mess around it, uh, um, BFS, is quote unquote inherently uh, uh, sequential. It's hard to parallelize it. Um, and and that's, that is a problem for parametric search because, because this is the method of, of choice to, to solve such problems. Uh, but in order to do it, I mean, I'll, let me very quickly go over it, to, <clears throat> uh, uh, to run parametric search efficiently, what you want to do is to take the decision procedure and simulate its execution at the unknown optimal value R star. Now, of course, you don't know R star, so you run the procedure and every time you, you reach a comparison, a bifurcation where you have to decide whether to go left or right, you find the critical value of the comparison, which is some concrete value of R, let's call it R zero, and then you, want to know whether R star is smaller, greater or equal to R zero, and that will determine how the decision procedure should run at R star. Now, how do you know if R uh, star is smaller or uh, greater and so on for R zero? You simply run the decision procedure at R zero, not the simulated one, the real one, and then the answer will tell you whether to go left or right. Um, and, and you keep doing it until you, you, you simulate the entire decision procedure. And when you end, the, you have a, an interval where R star has to lie because every such comp comparison shrinks the range where R star can lie. And at the end, you know what R star is. Now, of course, you don't want to pay the cost of the decision procedure at every comparison that you do because that will square the performance. So you want a parallel version. You want 
a small number of parallel layers where the comparisons have been dependent of each other. You want to collect all of them and run a binary search through them to determine all their outcomes using only a few calls to the, to the real decision procedure. So you need a parallel implementation in a fairly weak model to, uh, of the decision procedure to make the parametric search so optimization solution of it efficient. But if the decision procedure is how to parallelize, you have to find some other. And the te te technique of this old paper, which I'll just call BFKKS, is don't parallelize. Just run the decision procedure at R star as usual. And when you reach a comparison, bifurcate. I mean, you don't know, so, so say at the root of this tree, you compare R star with some R1. And so R star may be smaller than R1, bigger than R1, or equal. Equal is, is excellent because that means you found R star and you can stop right away. So let's ignore the equal case. So it's either smaller or larger. And you might look like you, you try both possibilities. <clears throat> so now when you go down the left part of the tree, you may reach uh, some other critical value R2, and again, you bifurcate and so on. Notice that sometimes you don't have to bifurcate. Because for example, when I reach R4, and I want to know whether R star is smaller or, or greater than R4, it may be the case that since I already know that R star is smaller than R2, I can, the R4 is greater than R2, then I know right away that R star is also smaller than R4, and I don't have to bifurcate. So the idea is that the, the tree will have hopefully plenty of unary nodes, and that would be good for, for the simulation. But it may have a lot of binary nodes as well, actually tertiary nodes, but never mind, ternary. Um, so this is a bifurcation tree that the method gets. So what do we do with it? Uh, we expand the tree for a while until we decide to stop. And we decide to stop in two cases, in one of two cases. Either we have collect, collected enough critical values, and, and this is good because if we get rid of all of them, we have made progress. Initially, we have, in the reverse shortest path problem, we have n square critical values, all possible distances between pairs of points. If we are reducing this number, the more we reduce it, the better we are progressing towards uh, knowing where our star is. So if we've collected enough uh, uh, comparison, we stop. And, and if not, but the tree has reached some uniform depth. So every path along the tree is of length at least S, some parameter S. This is also good news. Because if we now resolve all the comparisons in the tree, we know we we know that we can execute the decision procedure at R star for at least S steps. Because no matter what is the right path to follow in the tree for R star, it will have at link a length at least S, and we are making progress. So we're, ma we are making progress in both cases. And, uh, and hopefully we gain something uh, uh, by doing it. You, you said that you don't have to bifurcate at R4. Ah, yes, I, I don't bifurcate when I know the answer already because the, the history of the past until I reach the particular node already gives me information of where R star is. And so it is quite likely that I, when I compared R star with R4, say, I already know the answer. I know that R star has to be smaller than R4. And so there is no point in bifurcating with R star greater than R4. The, 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 that pass is impossible. So but did, I you, gave, you, but you only checked against R1 and R2, right? So yes, but, but perhaps, but, but notice that along this path, I already know that, that R star is smaller than R1 and smaller than R2. And if it happens that R4 is larger than R2, then obviously R star is smaller than R4. And I, I uh, okay, okay, right, okay, okay. yes, All right. they're not, yes, it, okay, yeah, the R's are not ordered, yeah, no, nice. no, 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 they're just, they're, they're just uh, uh, critical values that the decision procedure cooks up during its execution. There's no control over which values we will see. 
Okay, but uh, uh, so it's relatively simple. I mean, it's not that simple, but, uh, but we don't have to look for complicated parallel implementation of decision procedure. We just bifurcate for any decision procedure. But as it turns out, if we just do that, we gain very little, basically nothing, because we may generate too many critical uh, values. In spite of the unary uh, things, we, we cannot guarantee that the things will be efficient. So the, the idea, still going back to, to this older paper, is to first shrink by another method the interval of critical values uh, 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 to an interval i that does not, con that we know in advance does not contain too many critical values, say at most L of them for some parameter L, and then we run the bifurcation tree procedure. Now here, we are likely to gain a lot because if we have restricted R star so that there are only very few critical values in, in the interval, it means that most comparison, we will know the answer right away and we will not have to bifurcate because the, the critical values will lie outside the interval. And that's how we gain. And if, again, I will, I don't want to go into the technical details, which are a bit complicated, but if you do it right, you get uh, uh, the, the cost of the bifurcation is L to the one half dn. dn is the cost of the decision procedure on input of size n log n. <clears throat> you notice that in the uh, uh, RSP, reverse of the space problem, if L is n squared, if we don't do anything, and dn is n, we get here a quadratic algorithm, n square log n algorithm, which we don't like. Okay, uh, so the interval shrink, what, what, how, how do we do it? So again, consider the RSP problem. The critical values as I said are distances be between pairs of points, of input points. And so when, when given L, I want to construct an interval, say alpha beta, that contains R star and at most L critical uh, distance, pairwise distance. Now, this is easy to do in time n to the fourth third. There is an old paper, essentially several papers uh, uh, on so-called distance selection, which are given a set of points in the plane and some parameter K at most n choose two, I want to find the case smallest distance between pairs, a pair of points in the set. And that can be done in time into the fourth third using cuttings and all of this. I will mention a little bit later, but that's ancient history. Uh, but as shown in the BFKKS paper and, and as we generalize it to other situations, we can solve it in time n to the fourth third over L to the one third, i.e. faster. The, the, the idea is that we don't have to find the exact distance, we just have to find a range that contains L distances, and that should be simpler and faster to, to do if L is large. Um, okay. Um, so how do you do it? So you said this is, to find the L smallest distances? What no, you, no, just... to, find, to find an interval around R star, it has to contain R star, and it has to contain at most L, let's say, other distances. So it can be anywhere, but it, it's, its range in terms of critical values is at most L. It's, it's not the L smallest distances. I mean, it would be if R star were one of them, but in general, it will not. So you mentioned that you're using the black box, an algorithm that find the L smallest distances or something like that. A K smallest distances. K smallest, sorry. And, and not quite as a black box, but, but I mean, you, you can do it in, in yes, you, you, you can do it as a black, uh, in a black box manner if you want, uh, um, but, the way I'll show you, you do more, you do more or less the same thing that you would do to find the distance, but a little bit faster. Let me show you. The, the distance selection algorithm uses parameter search, 
and we do it too. So in fact, I'm a bit cheating by saying that the bifurcation thing does not have to do parametric search. It doesn't, but we are using in the background another procedure that does use parametric search, but let, let's ignore this issue. Um, so the decision procedure is not, not given R, uh, given P should be, sorry. I want to count the number of containments between points of P and annuli of a radius alpha and beta centered at this point. Because for example, in this example, here I have such an annulus around the red point and it has five other points and all these points are a distance between alpha and beta from the red point. So this is exactly what I want. So if I know for <coughs> how many such containments between points of P and annuli, I have, I will know how many distances lie between alpha and beta. Okay, this is a decision procedure for the parametric search. Uh, now to solve it, you need something that is called batch train searching, where we have n points and n congruent annuli of radii alpha and beta at center of the point. And we want to to find the total number of point annulus containments. And this is standard. I mean, for, for this particular problem, uh, you, you use uh, cuttings in the plane, which partition the plane into problems, each containing a small number of points and is crossed by the boundaries of a small number of annulus, annuli. Um, and you solve each point recursively, but uh, uh, before that, let me, let me jump right away to the next slide. So if you have a cell of the cutting, the, red, the green cell, there are annuli that contain it completely. And this is good because all the points in the cell lie at the required range of distances from the center of the annulus, like the blue annulus here. And there are some annuli whose boundary crosses the cell and they are not good because not all the points of the cell lie in them and I have to recurse on these points. But the cutting ensures that the number of such bad annuli is relatively small and the number of points in each cell is small. And I get a recurrence that if I work it out carefully, it ends up in N to the fourth cell. Now, let me go back. The, what we, uh, what we do here, we run the same idea as, as, uh, as we want, but we stop prematurely. So up to the leaps of the recursion, we only look at sure containments, those between cells and annuli that fully contain them, and we collect the number of containments between them, and this is good, this is a, a, a guaranteed to be okay. But in the, at the bottom of the recursion, we have problems where we don't know uh, uh, which distances are okay and which are not, and we resolve it by using random sampling. We, we take a sample of the distances at the bottom level of recursion, and we look at the sample. If it contains a, a many good distances, then we can kind of, uh, uh, um, or if it contains a small number of good distances, we can conclude that the number of, the overall number of good distances is small. This is like an epsilon net property, which I will not go too much into it. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and that's good because we, we can ascertain that the uh, bottom cell does not contribute to many distances between alpha and beta. If, we find out that the sample contains a lot of good points that will allow us by random, by, by picking uh, 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 the median of the sample to get a, a distance that is roughly the median of the distances within the uh, range. And that will allow us to cut the range into two and run the procedure recursively at one of the ranges, the ones that contain R star, which we will find 
by calling the decision procedure. So <clears throat> it's somewhat complicated. And again, I don't want to go into all the details, but, but the general idea that a, a, if we stop the recursion at the right depth, a, a, the overall running time will be small because we are not running the cutting phase to completion. We, we stop it earlier, it, it runs faster, but we can still guarantee randomized algorithm, but that's okay, uh, um, that uh, uh, it will, the, the final interval will contain at most L points, L critical values. So the two parts of the cost is the interval shrinking uh, uh, here and the bifurcation, which I mentioned earlier. And all you need to do is to choose the right value of L to balance the two terms, which is this one. And when you do, the running time becomes n to the four fifths, dn to the two fifths. And if the decision procedure in, indeed run, runs in linear or near linear time, we get this famous n to the six fifth performance. So this is the a, a, um, this is how how a, a, you can do it. So the the range searching part in this case is is standard. It's not. Uh, uh, does not need the new developments that I will mention soon, but in generalizing this problem, we may need more complicated range searching problems. But at any rate, so far we we saw that the method of BFKKS can solve the reverse short pass problem faster than the best algorithm that is only a year old. Uh, Stupid question. Just the part of the range searching. Why, why do you deal with annulai? I mean, can, if you solve it for this, you solve it for Anulai. You just run it twice. Or, and what am I, I mean? I mean, uh, uh, this is the decision version of the procedure because, um, I mean, the, you, you, you look for an interval that will contain at most L critical values. So now I give you an interval, alpha, beta, and ask you, does it contain at most L, L values, L critical values? And, and so this is what I'm trying to do. The annuli is just a way to count the number of critical values in that interval. I mean- So wh why can you, this decision problem, you, you can just run it on uh, disks with radius alpha, then run it to disk of radius beta and subtract in- uh... Uh, if, you run it, if you run it on disk, this is how you do it in the, um, in the distance select, <clears throat> sorry. No, I mean you. You can you can run the distance, and then you will know how many distances are at most r. If r is the radius of the disks, and then, then you run it again on the small on the left left uh, distance, the left uh, inter, the left part of the interval, and then subtract. If you know for any point how many are distance at most alpha and at most. Yes, beta. yes, but but if you want to ensure that the interval contains r star, you cannot do it like this way because this will give you the first L critical values. And as I said earlier, this is not what we want. Mm -hmm. We want L critical values around R star. We don't want to, to, to let R star go away. We want, we, we want to keep R star in the interval because this is where we are searching for it. Uh, if R star goes out of the interval, we, we lost it. We don't know how to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, the nice part about it is that there is nothing very special about points in the plane and Euclidean distances between them, and we can generalize the interval shrinking to any, to anything. I mean, with some care, of course, but so the distance itself is not very important. It may satisfy the triangular inequality, which would be nice. It might not. Um, uh, the, the points can be any collection of geometric objects in any dimensions, and the, and the method would still work. You will simply have to solve the interval shrinking uh, uh, problem in a, in a more general manner. Um, so you have to replace those annuli by more complicated uh, 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 semi-algebraic sets. Uh, and you run into semi-algebraic range searching problem on the objects of on the input objects um, 
So if the input objects have T degrees of freedom, uh, you can represent them as points in some T dimensional space. And each of them uh, defines a range that consists of all the points that lie at distance in quotation marks a, a, between alpha and beta from the object that defines the range. So it's in full generality of the example that we have just shown. Now, typically these ranges will be semi-algebraic. Semi-algebraic means that I define each such range by a, as a Boolean predicate that involves polynomial inequalities. So I can say you know, so the, uh, the, the annulus is that it has to lie that the distance from the center, which is x minus a square plus y minus b square has to be at least a, a alpha square and at most beta. Square. So we have two, a conjunction of two polynomial inequalities. And in general, this will capture most uh, 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 things you can think of. Uh, um, so this calls for semi-algebraic, for batched semi-algebraic range searching, where we have n points in some dimension and uh, uh, n ranges in this particular case. And it's interesting to note that each range has also t degrees of freedom, because each range is in fact a point. I mean, it comes from a point like the center of the annuli uh, uh, earlier, and, and the point defines the range. The, the, this alpha and beta are fixed, are not part of the input. So we have a, a symmetric version of the problem where both input objects and query ranges have the same number of degrees of freedom. Just to be uh, clear, you're, are you, you're still counting the number of hops in the incidence graph? Uh, well, I, I'll show you a lot of other problems where, uh, where which are completely different. But for now, just think about it, yes, if you want. I mean, you can, I, I'm now forgetting the, right now, I'm forgetting the, the motivating problem and I'm just thinking about this interval shrinking business. So there is some distance between objects and it defines a, a critical values, which are the distances between person objects. And I want to shrink the interval of critical values to one that contains at most L values. We later use it in solving more general problems if time permits. I'm not talking fast enough. Um, um, okay, so in the most general case, so let's forget the motivating optimization problem for the minute. So in the most general case, we have a set of M points in T dimensions, and we have a set of semi-algebraic regions of constant complexity, which means that there is only a constant number of inequalities that define them, and each inequality is with a polynomial of constant degree. Um, there is a huge, I mean, almost any geometric object you can think of, you can represent it as a semi-algebraic uh, region. And uh, the alpha-beta annuli that we spoke about generalize naturally to, to this setup. In general, in the ranges may have s degrees of freedom, which is different from t, but let's only consider the case that s equal t, which is the case in the optimization problem that we are looking at. And the goal, it again depends what you want to know. You, you might want to just detect whether some point lies in some region, or you want to count, as we did before, how many such containments there are, or you may report all of them, or you may represent them in some compact manner. There, there, are, there are a lot of variants that you can see of, but more or less, this is the setup. Um, now, the, the story is, the reason I mention it is that this is kind of new. I mean, semi-algebraic range searching is not new. Uh, it came out naturally when you started to uh, generalize uh, range search, uh, standard range searching. Um, so there is even a paper by Agarwal and Matushek from 94 that does it, but they didn't know how to do it uh, the right way, so to speak. And they get, they got in this paper very inferior bounds because the only way they 
could do it is by linearization, by taking the inequalities, the polynomial inequalities and linearize them by introducing a lot of variables uh, so that the polynomial become, be, became a, a linear expression. Uh, because if the constraints are linear, we have a, a half space range searching, which is the problem that people knew how to solve uh, uh, already in the 1990s. Um, but the general case was there for a long time, but there were no good tools to solve it. And it came, it, and, and only now, very recently, we know how to solve it, actually, quote unquote, uh, 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 optimally, or almost optimally, using polynomial partitioning. So there was an all a, a bit earlier paper with Agarwal Matushek and myself, but the two key papers that I will want to mention is one by Matushek and Patakova, one of the last papers that uh, Irka wrote, and more recently by Agarwal on of Ezra and Zal. Um, okay, so for the few of you who may have forgotten what poem partitioning is, just a, a couple of slides. It started with Gut and Katz from 2010, who showed that if you have a set of endpoints in D dimensions and some degree D, you can construct a polynomial of degree roughly D. Uh, and such a polynomial, the zero set of the polynomial, Z of F, uh, uh, divides the D-dimensional space into roughly D to the D connected components. This is a standard result in algebraic geometry, but they, what you can guarantee is that each of these components will contain at most N over D to the D points of P. So the partition of the points among the cells is more or less uniform. And this has been generalized by Good five years later, who extended it for any collection of constant degree algebraic varieties. So, which again, given a degree D, you construct a polynomial of the degree roughly D, and each of the set D to the D cells connect components of the complement of the zero set is intersected by at most N over D to the D minus K varieties. The, the two bounds, it is fairly easy to see, you need a little bit of algebraic geometry, that this is always true no matter which polynomial you use on average. This is the average number of containments or intersections per cell. But those two results are very powerful because they guarantee worst case, so to speak. Every cell is contains or is intersected by no more than this number of, uh, of points or varieties. So this is a, a poor rendering. The blue curve is the zero set and you see cells so the, each cell contain a few points as it intersected by a few lines and so on. Um, and this has become a, a completely new and extremely powerful tool for solving problems in combinatorial geometry. <coughs> it all started with the Guten Katz paper who solved Erdes distinct distance problem almost optimally, which created a large uh, stir in the community. But in a lot of papers in, uh, with results of combinatorial geometry that use polynomial partitioning have emerged in the decade plus since then. But the algorithmic front remained a, a, a withdrawn, so to speak, because first of all, it's very expensive to construct such a polynomial. And the main thing is that you can do not control what happens on the zero set. You guarantee that each cell of the complement of the zero set contains or intersected by only so many, but it may happen that all the points or all the, the varieties or whatever lie in the zero set and there is no guarantee what happens. And that, is, that was an obstacle for a long time, but those two papers addressed it in a fairly complicated manner. They use constant degree polynomials to make sure that the construction is not ex very expensive, but the partition is, is quite awful. When you read their main result, each of them spreads all over, almost over a page to, 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 to tell you exactly how, how you do it. And let me just say that they solve 
dual versions of the problem. Uh, the Matushik Patagora paper solved the original rain searching, and the other paper solved the dual point enclosure, where the input is a set of ranges and the query is a point, and you want to know whether the point lies in any range, how many ranges it lies in, and so on. Uh, and the result, remarkably, are basically identical to the results that were known for 30 years or so for half space range search. With linear storage, the query times takes n to the one minus one over t if you're in t dimensions, t degrees of freedom. And if you want fast query time and a, a, a lot of storage, then you can use n to the t storage and get logarithmic or maybe sometimes polylogarithmic query. These are the results for half space range searching, so it's quite remarkable that they also work for semi algebraic range searching. And if we apply these two techniques, applying the MP technique for a while and then <laughs> the dual version and apply the AAEV technique without going into details, my time doesn't allow it anyway, you eventually uh, uh, um, can solve the range searching problem like the, like the decision procedure for distance selection in time n to the 2t over t plus 1. When t is two, you get the n to the fourth third for distance selection. Um, and as I said, it's it's a mess. If you, it doesn't work that easily. You have to work harder to 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 make sure that the problem sizes remain under control. I will not discuss all of this. Uh, let me just say that it is it, it is difficult to do it, technically difficult to do it, but. Uh, and, and it's even more becoming more complicated because for the interval shrinking business, we have to stop this recurrence prematurely. And we have to make sure that we stop it more or less with the same size of each problem. It's a mess, uh, uh, but it can be done. And for interval shrinking, you can solve it in this time. And again, when t is equal to two, you get this n to the four third over n to the one third. And when you balance the cost of the interval shrinking and the bifurcation, this is what you get. And again, if t is two and dn of n uh, is linear in n, you get the n to the six fifths. So this is like a grand generalization of one. Now, as I suspected, or was afraid the time is not very friendly. Um, so I will tell you about the other applications and hope when Danny stops me. Um, so for example, uh, uh, we can apply it for the to the reverse shortest pass problem for weighted unit distance. <clears throat> so now we don't want pass of lengths at most k or with at most k edges but we give each edge the Euclidean distance of it as, an a, as a weight, and we want to find a, a, the smallest R star such that the G R star contains a path of total weight or total length at most W for some W. Now, the decision procedure here is trickier, but it has been done by Wang and Xu uh, with almost linear running time. So again, we can use our technique and get into the six feet. I just want to mention that, that Wang and Zhao in their end of the five quarter solution mentioned this is an open problem, how to go beyond into the fourth third. Um, and you, you can do it in higher dimensions. For example, if you want to do reverse shortest pass in three dimensions, uh, the, the disks that you draw around each point in the grid and so on have to be replaced by spheres. And again, you face questions about uh, um, upper envelopes of spheres, but there are techniques in three dimensions, there are techniques to do it. In higher dimension, you, you, you have to work out a lot of additional details. And the distance selection itself is not end to the fourth third anymore. Um, because now you have three degrees of freedom to represent the point. So it takes n to the three half time. But again, the technique interpolates between the two bounds and you get n to the seven teams over 20, which is better than the n to the three half. 
Uh, and if you, we go back to the discrete crochet distance and want to solve it in D dimension, so D greater than two, the decision procedure still takes linear time because it is just a search for a monotone pass in a zero one matrix. It's, it doesn't care where the distances come from. But the distance selection, if you're in D dimensions, will take into the 2D over D plus one time as we, because there are D degrees of freedom now, as we discussed earlier. And we can make interval shrinking to look, to take time like that. And again, if you balance as before, you get some exponent that is better. Um, this is an intersect in interesting application, perfect matching in intersectional proximity graphs. So it, it comes from a paper by Bonnet, Cabello, and Mulzer, a recent paper that shows how to do, how to find pro, uh, randomly, but never mind, maximum matching in unique disk graph and in some more general intersection graphs of this of different radii, in times n to the omega over two, where omega is the exponent of metric multiplication. So, uh, and if you use that uh, uh, as a decision procedure, you can solve the problem of finding perfect metrics in intersection or proximity graphs. But for unit these graphs, you want to find the smallest R star, so if I look at the unit disk graph GR star, it has a perfect matching. Because I will simply run the algorithm of uh, Bonnet and company. Uh, if you give me R, I will run it on, on G of R and I'll get a maximum matching. If this maximum is a perfect matching, I'm fine. If not, I know I have to increase R. So it, it is a good decision procedure and um, uh, and if we combine it with the technique, uh, we get something like that. So for example, for arbitrary disk, we get n to the three plus omega over four, which is again better than the, uh, the bound in the distance selection problem and the, um, which is n to the three half for arbitrary disk because there are three degrees of freedom and so on. Um, for Unidis, there is a completely different approach that solves it faster, but it still serves as a good example of the method. Um, so time is running up. Uh, uh, okay, there are two things I want to, to mention. Uh, uh, let, me, let me mention that one. Uh, so I want to do distance selection. I want to find the case a, a smallest distance in a set of points, but uh, or in a more general set of geometric uh, disjoint objects, uh, but K is very small. Not uh, one, but uh, I don't know, square root of N or something like that. The, the observation here is the decision procedure can be implemented faster because uh, uh, again, it it corresponds to an intersection problem between the Minkowski sums, as we saw earlier, and, and that if we only want k distances, we want k intersections among the Minkowski sums, and we can simply run a line sweeping algorithm that will count the number of intersections and stop if the number is larger than k, and that will take only roughly n plus k time. And um, okay, this is just a reminder of the situation. We take the, the objects, turn them into Minkowski sums and simply run line sweeping to compute the number of intersections. We have to divide it by two because two such things intersect at two points, they are pseudo this, never mind. Um, so for example, if we run it on a, on a, a set of these arbitrary sizes, the standard cost of distance selection will be n to the three half, as I said several times already, because there are three degrees of freedom, but we can improve it to n to the three quarters k to the one half. So when k is small, like smaller than n to the three half, we get a faster algorithm. And um, Chen has a similar result uh, uh, um, 
but tailored only for distances between points and has some other uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, okay, so here is another completely crazy uh, uh, example. Uh, now the input consists of segments, and but and, and the distance between them. So here are two segments C and E prime. The distance is the the smallest r, so that if I expand each segment in along its direction by distance r, uh, by r, I may either add r to the length of the sequence uh, of the uh, segment or multiply the length by r, whichever you, you like. And so it's the smallest such value for which the expanded segments interval. Okay, so it's a distance, it's uh, not a very natural one, but uh, um, um, you can apply it to, to, to this problem. Uh, um, the standard cost of distance selection will be n to the eight fifths, because segments have four degrees of freedom, the coordinates of the two endpoints. So it is, you know, this two t over t plus one, when t is four, you get n to the eight fifths. Uh, but we can improve it to n to the 8th, 11th, k to the 6th, 11, which improves the bound when k is smaller than n to the 8th, 5th. Um, so this is just, here of course the semi-algebraic uh, setup is quite more complicated, but again, uh, uh, it can be done in general. And the last one I want to mention is this maximum height independent towers problem that has the nickname of seeing the most without being seen. What we have, let me go directly to the next slide. What we have is a polyhedral a, a, a terrain, polygonal terrain. This is the one dimensional X monotone polygonal curve as shown here. And we have a set of points uh, on that curve. And at each point, we want to erect a vertical tower of height H, as shown here. And we want to find the largest value of H so that no pair of towers will see, we, the tips of no pairs of towers will see one another. So the towers like privacy, they do not like to be watched by other towers, but they want to see as much as possible, so they have to be as high as possible. So you can see here a, 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 the, um, the, what is the critical value. So a critical value is a, a height at which some pair can start seeing each other. So it's, it's so P and P prime can start seeing each other when the height, when the segment connecting the tips of the towers pass through, it lies completely above the curve. This means that they can see each other, but except for for one point, one vertex that this segment grazes, so to speak. And so the problem is slightly more complicated because now a critical value depends on three points, two points, two input points, and one vertex of the uh, curve of the of the terrain. But uh, but there are tricks going back to Varadarajan and and others that show how to do it. A, a paper with Matia and others, which I don't remember the exact reference right now, it tells you how to do it. And, um, and, uh, and you can do it in near linear time. Um, and, and, and that allows you to solve the problem in end of the fifth, uh, uh, fifth time, the same, same old exponent. Um, okay, enough. Um, ah, there is something else, which is this joint work with Pankajus that I was hoping to conclude the talk with, but I really should not uh, stretch my luck too much. Um, a, a obvious open problems is is to to understand what's going on. I mean, we what what happened is that we took this old technique. We saw that it can be applied in a variety of situations. That it usually requires more involved semi-algebraic range searching, which now we know how to solve. And so we just combined everything together, extended it here and extended it here, and, and there, and got something. 
Uh, but it clearly doesn't feel like that this is the end of the road. It's unlikely that the reverse shortest pass problem really, the, the end of the six fifths is, is really the correct answer. It's just a limitation of the technique and the goal is to understand better what's going on and try to, to improve and extend and maybe even replace the technique with something that will give you faster algorithms and looking for additional applications and lots of other open problems that I will not mention. 